what helium can tell us about volcanoes. This is by Eric Clementi on Wired. These are images of Yellowstone supervolcano. Some of the highest amounts of helium are released here in the basin, Heart Lake Geyser Basin. After Yellowstone's sizable earthquake on March 30th that took place uh, a few years ago, there were a lot of craziness. People were throwing around theories that animals were running from the park in fear that the earthquake could trigger an eruption and that helium emissions were rising in the caldera, meaning an eruption was coming. Now, in my fervor to stifle such fear-mongering, I said that no, none of these events are in any way related to a potential upcoming eruption at Yellowstone. Well, I received an email from Dr. Jacob Lowenstern, the scientist in charge of the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, that brought me back from getting carried away because of those three, one of those three could actually tell us about activity in the caldera. No, it wasn't the animals, they're just migrating. And no, the earthquake is not going to trigger an eruption. However, there is an interesting story in regards to helium and magmatic activity. And it turns out that helium might be able to help in volcano monitoring in the future. Before we get too far, let's make one thing abundantly clear. Helium emissions in Yellowstone in no way suggest an eruption is in the works, so let that sink in. But helium, and especially the ratio between helium's two naturally occurring isotopes, helium-3 and helium-4, can tell us about the source of the helium. Within the Earth, helium can come from two main sources. One is the mantle, where it's primordial helium from the formation of the planet, and two it comes from the crust, where it comes from the radioactive decay of elements like uranium and thorium. These two sources of helium, however, have different flavors. Mantle-derived primordial helium is dominated by the lighter helium-3, two protons and one neutron while the decay of elements in the crust will produce the heavier helium-4, two protons and two neutrons, also known as the alpha particle, one of the ways elements decay radioactively. This means that when you measure the isotopic ratio of helium being released in soils, hot springs, wells, or fumaroles, you can determine how much of that helium is being derived from either degassing of magma coming from mantle or from the radioactive decay of uranium and thorium in the crust. If the helium-3, helium-4 is high, then the mantle source is dominating. If the helium-3, helium-4 is low, then the crust source is dominating. When we talk about these ratios, normally we compare them to the helium-3, helium-4 ratio in the atmosphere. So if the helium ratios tend to be reported in multiples of Ra, which is the ratio in the atmosphere, for mantle sources, that is something like 16 Ra or more, and for crustal sources, it is 1 to 3 Ra. Two recent studies looked at helium emissions in active volcanic areas. The first is looking at the, elements, ele the events leading up to the October 12, 2011 eruption at the El Hierro volcano in the Canary Islands. A study by Padron and others in 2013 in Geology magazine examined the relationship between the helium emissions measured in soils across the island and the helium-3, helium-4 ratio in water from the well on the island. What they found is that the earthquakes increased increasing during late summer into early fall, so did the helium emissions across the island. From nine kilometers every day, to over 24 kilometers per day just prior to the eruption. Hand in hand with that, the helium-3, helium-4 ratio also increased from 2 to 3 Ra to over 8 Ra. That's the helium in the atmosphere. Padron and others, 2013, suggest that the earthquakes helped create fractures for the helium to escape, like a natural fracking process. 
as the magma rose and degassing under the island. However, the crustal helium signature, low RA, was also overwhelmed by the mantle helium signature, high RA, from the magma. So the closer the magma got to the surface, the more helium was released and the higher the helium-3, helium-4 ratio became. But it wasn't that simple. After the eruption in early October, the helium emissions decreased with the decreasing seismicity. When seismicity picked back up again in late October, early November, the helium emissions went back up again, but the helium-3, helium-4 ratio did not go back up again. Instead, it stayed below 5 RA, suggesting that the helium was coming from the crust that makes up the island and not the mantle-derived magma. The new earthquakes in the northern part of the island cra created cracks for the helium to escape, but that helium was not entirely related to new magma. In fact, helium emissions overall peaked at 38 kilograms per day well after the initial eruption began, while helium-3, helium-4 peaked with the eruption itself. Overall, the helium emissions seemed to track very closely with the amount of seismicity, while the helium-3, helium-4 crack tracking tracked with the rising of magma into the crust until the eruption. Helium-3, helium-4 ratio related to seismicity has also been noticed in Mammoth Mountain near Long Valley Caldera in California, which is another supervolcano, of course, just neighboring Yellowstone. It's on the Ring of Fire, which is interpreted as the evidence that moving magma deep in the crust is driving the earthquake swarms there. So that's very significant. At Yellowstone, helium tells us a different story. A study in Nature magazine by Lawrence Stern and others, 2014, examined the voluminous helium that is released within and around the Yellowstone supervolcano caldera. What they found there is the most productive areas of helium emissions, like Heart Lake Geyser, Geyser Basin in the southern margin of the caldera, are actually mainly releasing helium derived from the crust, not any magma underneath Yellowstone. If you look at Yellowstone, the highest helium-3, helium-4 ratios are in the heart of the caldera, with 10 to 17 RA, relatively close to the assumed mantle hotspot consumption of 22 RA. At Heart Lake Geyser Basin, helium-3, helium-4 is less than 2.5 RA, so very strongly controlled by crustal sources. Lower Stern and others, in their 2014 calculated how much helium-4 the crust underneath Yellowstone could produce based on the uranium and thorium content found that the Yellowstone area releases at almost 600 times more helium-4 than it should based on the decay of uranium and thorium. So this means that it's likely released, released helium that has been trapped in the crust for millions to billions of years and parts of Yellowstone sit on crust that is over 3 billion years old. This helium at Yellowstone is in no way related to the magma underneath the Yellowstone caldera, but has likely been freed from the crust by earthquakes and heating of the crust done by magma, much like what happened at El Hierro in the Canary Islands. So you can begin to see the problem we currently have with using helium for volcano monitoring. The amount of helium being released does not tell us much as helium of any flavor might be liberated by earthquakes under a volcano. We need to know the ratio of helium-3 to helium-4 of that helium to understand whether the changes in emissions are actually related to the magma as opposed to the, the crust. So why is it a problem? Well, there isn't an easy way to measure helium-3, helium-4 ratios in the field. Instead, samples have to be taken back to the lab to be analyzed so getting fast and cheap helium-3, helium-4 ratios is not possible right now. If you only consider the amount of helium being released at the volcano, you're only getting a piece of the full picture. Imagine you're, that you notice a flood going down your street. It could be coming from the downpour that go, that's going on, or it could be from a broken, a broken water main up the street, 
merely measuring how much water is running into the gutter is not going to, sufficient, uh, to be sufficient enough to tell the source. These two studies clearly show that we can learn a lot from measuring helium emissions and their isotopic composition. At the Canary Island El Hero, Hero volcano, it's clear that there is a disconnect at times between the helium emissions and the composition of that helium, mantle versus crust source. While at Yellowstone, there is a significant volume of stored helium in the crust that can be released by processes unrelated to anything that could lead to uh, an eruption from the magma underneath. So step by step, we're moving towards better being able to anticipate the action at a volcano, but sometimes you need to be careful not to get carried away without understanding exactly what is happening. Me included, he says. This is by referenced by Lawrence Stern at USGS, uh, USGS at the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, and by Padron, he's from uh, the having to do with the Canary Island El Hierro volcanic eruption. And this is on Wired. I'll leave a link below for you for this. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.